Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering hyponatremia. I'm going to start a series on fluid uh, balance and imbalance, and the first electrolyte I'm going to be going over is sodium. So this video is going to be hyponatremia. I have another one for hypernatremia coming soon, so look out for that. I have not finished my uh, cardiac congenital disorders. That's coming too, so just rock with me guys it's coming anyway sodium before i get started please like this video now so you don't forget you know you're gonna love the video like it now subscribe to this channel if you have done so already don't forget i have audio lessons available for you on my website nexusnursinginstitute.com so sodium i put 135 145 here just to remind you that is the range now remember this is not an absolute range some textbooks may say 136 134 uh because uh different labs the number may be off by one or two but in that area i promise for nclex the number will be way off you will know if that patient is hypernatremic hyponatremic or if the sodium's um within normal range it's not going to be off by one or two but anyway sodium this is a mineral it's a major um cash on positively charged particle in the extracellular fluid and it maintains extracellular fluid osmolarity I'm going to go down here to the pathophysiology and look what it says about the, my line on, yes it is. Look at what it says about the pathophysiology. We'll start with hyponatremia. Remember I told you so it's sodium 135 to 145. So hyponatremia will be less than 135. This textbook, I think it actually says sodium is 136 to 145. So this is saying less than 136. Like I said, guys, it can be off by one or two numbers when it comes to sodium. Sodium doesn't have that narrow of a therapeutic range. So hyponatremia is an electrolyte imbalance in which the serum sodium is below around that 135, 136 level, okay? Hyponatremia can occur from two changes. So two things can cause hyponatremia. Reduced excitable membrane depolarization and cellular swelling. Let's look at the causes. I'm going to scroll up here because the causes are important for you guys to know. And I put a star next to the ones that tend to show up the most on nursing exams, NCLEX, ATI, HESI. I don't write the exam, guys. So any of these can show up. I just put a star next to the ones that if you're asked about sodium, this is usually what they're trying to pull out of you. This is what they ask about the most, okay? So causes for sodium. When the patient actually has sodium deficit, so it's not like... um patient has too much sodium, too much sodium. It's not like the patient has too much fluids and their sodium is dilute. It's like they have enough sodium, it's just being diluted by all the fluids. No, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the actual sodium level is decreased. There's actual sodium deficits. What can cause that? Excessive di um, I can't speak. Excessive diaphoresis. What is diaphoresis? Sweating. Your sweat is what? Salty. So the person sweating a lot, they can lose a lot of their sodium through the sweat. Diuretics. When you're urinating, guess what else comes out with the urine? Sodium. Wound drainage, especially GI drainage. That can cause the patient to have hyponatremia if they have heavy wound drainage. A low salt diet if they're just not ingesting enough salt. Now let's talk about relative sodium deficits. And this is where um, the sodium the, the sodium level's low, but it's not really low because of the actual amount of sodium. And I already gave you guys an example of dilutional sodium when the patient's just holding on to so much fluids, the sodium that they do have is diluted. So look at this, excessive ingestion of hypotonic fluids. Well, that makes sense because if they're, um, um, ingesting all of this hypotonic fluids, what do you think is going to happen to that sodium level? It's going to drop. Kidney failure. Well, that makes sense. Kidney's not working the way it's supposed to be working. It's not filtering the blood the way it's supposed to be filtering the blood. It's not excreting the fluids the way it's supposed to excrete the fluids. What's going to happen? It's going to hold on to it, right? It's going to be holding on to all those fluids and um, that um, all that fluid can make that sodium be decreased. Syndrome of inappropriate inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. That's the SIADH. So these guys, you absolutely need to know the causes. You really don't re need to know the difference of the actual sodium versus the relative sodium deficits, but you need to know 
the causes of all these deficits for um, hyponatremia. Now let's jump to assessment. Oop. Hold on guys. Yes, honey. Hey baby. Did you guys get food? I did not get food. I love you. Love you too. Goodbye. I forgot to put my phone on airplane mode. Those of you who are parents, you understand. You forgive me, right? Okay. Let's keep going. Let's talk about assessment. Assessment of the hyponatremic patient. One moment, guys. Hello? Would you like anything from Chick fil A? No, thank you, sweetheart. All right. I love you. Love you too. Bye bye. Bye bye. As I was saying, um, clinical manifestations for the patient with hyponatremia what signs and symptoms are we going to see? The, mo the sign and symptom you're going to see most often when you are thinking of hyponatremia, the first thing that needs to go through your mind should be CNS changes, changes in the level of consciousness. Let's take a look at this. Cerebral, so the brain. Cerebral changes are the most obvious problems of hyponatremia. Closely observe and document the patient's behavior, level of consciousness, and mental status. When sodium levels become very low, seizures coma, and death can occur. What else can we see in that patient with hyponatremia? Where's my highlighter? Neuromuscular changes. That is also a sign and symptom of hyponatremia. Muscle weakness. Deep tendon reflexes diminish. They're not as strong. You can also see intestinal changes, increased motility. So what happens when motilities increase, we'll see things like diarrhea. And when motilities decrease, we'll see things like constipation. So when it comes to hyponatremia, we see increased motility, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal cramping. Why abdominal cramping? Because the motility, the movement of the GI tract has increased. Bowel movements are frequent and watery. Other signs and symptoms, cardiovascular changes. Now, there are two types of cardiovascular changes depending on the cause, so I'm going to go over both of them. So cardiovascular changes are seen. The cardiac responses to hyponatremia with hypovolemia. So the patient's um, sodium is low with fluid deficits, okay? What are we going to see? Peripheral pulses are going to be difficult to palpate. And that makes sense. If the patient has fluid deficits, it's not like you're going to have a strong bounding pulse. It's going to be hard to pal palpate it. Peripheral pulses are hard to palpate and they're easily blocked with light pressure. Why? They already don't have enough fluid going through the vessel as it is. So it's going to be very easy the minute you apply pressure that it just diminishes, right? Blood pressure is decreased. Remember, guys, all blood pressure is is the amount of force that the fluid is exerting against the vessel walls. The less fluid, the less force. So this makes sense. So that patient that has hyponatremia with hypovolemia, we expect to see these signs and symptoms. Weak pulse, pulse that's easily diminished or blocked once you apply pressure, okay? Low blood pressure. Now look at this, hyponatremia with hypervolemia. So now, the, yes, the sodium is still low, but the sodium is still low and the patient has fluid volume excess. They got way too much fluid in the vessels. What signs and symptoms are we going to see cardiac-wise then? The opposite, we're going to see a full bounding pulse with a normal to high blood pressure. The peripheral pulses are going to be full and difficult to block and uh, may not be palpable if edema is... Um, is present. And the reason for that, guys, all that swelling, that's the cause. 
So interventions, actually, before I get to nursing interventions, let's look at this alert. It says, if muscle weakness is present, remember, muscle weakness is an absolutely it's a sign of hyponatremia. If muscle weakness is present, immediately check respiratory effectiveness because ventilation depends on adequate strength of respiratory muscles. Duh, that makes sense. So that patient has hyponatremia. We know their muscles are weak. Guess what? Doesn't it take muscles to get those lungs to expand, right? So that patient can get adequate amount of oxygen? Absolutely. So this is very important to know. All right, interventions. The specific cause of the low sodium levels determined to plan the most appropriate management. So really, guys, the intervention is going to be depending on what's causing the hyponatremia. So whatever it is is causing the hyponatremia, that's what we're going to try to fix. So they won't be hyponatremic anymore. Look at what it says here. The priorities for nursing care of the patient with hyponatremia are monitoring the patient's response to therapy. We need to make sure whatever we're doing for the patient that's actually working and preventing hypernatremia and fluid overload. I love this part. This is so important because so many times, guys, you will get test questions on something like this. Not this exact thing, but this concept. So I need to explain it to you so that you can understand. Whenever you're trying to correct an issue, you need to make sure that you don't overcorrect the issue. And so many test questions that you get, you'll be so focused. So they'll give you a patient's um, diagnosis and they'll, they'll tell you that you're giving a medication and they'll ask you, what are you looking out for? And you'll be so focused on that diagnosis. You will be so focused on that medication, what that medication does, you completely forget about an adverse effect, which is overcorrecting the issue. So for example, patient that's diabetic, you're giving them insulin, what's going to be one of your priority concerns? That medication working a little bit too well and you causing that patient to have hypoglycemia and now they're on the ground. Okay, so look at what it says. Let me repeat this because I want to make sure you guys catch this. The priorities for nursing care for the patient with hyponatremia are monitoring the response, making sure it works, and preventing hypernatremia and fluid overload. Let's keep going. When hyponatremia occurs with fluid volume deficit, so patient has hyponatremia, but they don't have enough fluids. IV saline infusions are prescribed to restore both the sodium and fluid volume. Look at what they said. Did I underline it for you? No, I didn't. Right here. IV saline. Patient's going to get normal saline. So they're going to get fluids. The IV fluids is going to help increase the vascular volume, right? And it's normal saline to help get that sodium up. Severe hyponatremia can be treated with small volume infusions, small volume guys, of hypertonic saline, most often 3% saline. Let's keep going. When hyponatremia occurs with fluid volume excess, so they still have hyponatremia, but they got too much fluids, drug therapy includes giving drugs that promote excretion of water. Let's get rid of all, if the water's a problem, you got all this fluid, let's get rid of the fluid, okay? Excretion of water rather than sodium. So we'll give them something where we can get rid of the fluids, but not rid of the sodium because they're already hyponatremic. We're not trying to get rid of the sodium, we're just trying to get rid of the fluid. So here's our medications, guys. And you know I can't pronounce. Conivaptan, Tolvaptan, these two drugs, you see it. Drug therapy for hyponatremia that's caused by um, SI, um, that's caused by inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone, that's their SIDH, may include lithium and declomycin. You're going to assess hourly for signs of excessive fluid loss. We're not trying to throw the patient into fluid volume deficit. So we have to be very careful as we're decreasing the fluid that we don't decrease it too much or too fast. So you're going to be assessing that patient for signs and symptoms of excessive fluid loss and increased sodium levels. One more thing I want to bring to your attention. Therapy involves increasing oral sodium intake and restricting oral fluid intake. And that makes sense. That patient's hyponatremic. They're hyponatremic, the sodium's down. So we're going to try to get that sodium back up by giving them oral sodium intake. But we're not trying to have all that sodium be diluted by all this fluid. So we're going to restrict the oral fluid intake. 
And basically that is your hyponatremia in a nutshell on another video. I promise hypernatremia is coming next, but let me know what you thought about um, hyponatremia. Let me know if there's anything that you'd like me to cover that I haven't done so already. I have a long growing list. I promise you guys, I'm going to get to them, but you see, I'm making one video a day, sometimes two, but not very often. So it's going to take me a while, but guys, I see your comments. And if I don't already have it on my list, I add it to my list. Um, don't forget, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And almost daily, you can catch me uh, covering um, a variety of nursing questions on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So guys, thank you for watching this video. Thank you for being patient with me as I had to answer my phone twice during this video. And you guys will catch me on the next video.